Okay, thank you. So welcome everyone. We are really glad to be here. Uh, for those of you that still don't know me, I am Dr. Laila Sandroni, and I am a step fellow with the IAI, participating in the organizing team of this amazing course, and also being a facilitator for these amazing groups. Uh, so welcome to our last week. Uh, it's incredible. Time just flew by. I don't know if you all feel the same but it's amazing but we are reaching to our last week of our online course and but we still have two really great sessions this week to close with a golden key i don't know if this is expression makes sense in english but in portuguese it does um but so Uh, just some housekeeping, as you all know, we have interpretation to, from English to Spanish and from Spanish to English. You all know about this at this point. And this week is week seven, and we are going to address in this session, uh, transdisciplinary grant writing assessment and evaluation. We'll have the opportunity uh, to hear from uh, our a transdisciplinary uh, consulting team about uh, grant writing processes. So I think this will be a really important session to all because all the amazing concepts and theoretical frames and uh, on the ground examples that were explored uh, throughout the previous TD sessions will be grounded also today in how to make a proposition like those that you have heard about throughout all the, the, the process of the course can be uh, built in a successful way. So this is a really important uh, toolkit session for the ones that sh um, are willing and able to move forward uh, to the in-person workshop. So before we begin and I pass on the floor to our uh, amazing speakers, uh, I just like to share with you some um, processes about the course itself and the evaluation since we are now reaching our last week. So uh, the criteria for the evaluation of the concept notes each team should deliver as the main product of the course uh, was shared with you. So um, the idea was to be as transparent as possible uh, on how your projects and your conceptual notes will be reviewed by the organizing team. So each of the concept notes that you deliver at the end of this course will be evaluated by at least two of us, and we will all follow the same set of criteria that's now also shared with you. So you, you should uh, read this document carefully and try to address the questions that are implemented there. So, uh, and if you have any questions about how this evaluation will uh, occur, and if you don't understand any parts of the concept note, please reach out to your facilitators. So uh, the Spanish version is also available at the bottom of the document. So it's a bilingual document. So everyone can have uh, direct access to it. And this is the, the rubric that will be used to evaluate your concept notes in the end. Um, so to, to move forward and to have your concept note evaluated, as we already, uh, someone has their microphone on, and I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Uh, so uh, as part of the process of evaluation and to have your concept notes evaluated by the organizing team, as we said previously, two members, at least two members of each team should have passed the, uh, the course to get a certificate for the course. And for that, you have to fulfill two requirements. One would be the attendance uh, for, for the course, and the second would be the final exam. 
uh, it will be a multiple choice and true false format test that you will take online. And the exam will remain open until uh, 11.59, until the end of the day, Eastern time uh, on Thursday, November 10. So you will have uh, about uh, one week uh, to fulfill the text, uh, to fulfill the test and be able to get a certificate. Uh, and the percentage uh, for um, attendance is plus 70% of live Zoom sessions and the final exam. The certificate of participation will be sent out to all eligible participants via the email. So regardless of seeking to move forward to phase two, uh, everyone, in, including individual participants that have more than 70% of attendance and take the test will uh, receive the certificate for the online course. Um, so please again, check regularly that your microphones are muted and uh, the attendance is being verified throughout the whole course. And we still kindly ask that your cameras remain known if you can during the session, because it really makes a difference for our speakers. And due to time constraints, only some questions will be answered during the session and the rest will be answered via email. And as usual, this is a 90 minute session that will begin with our uh, case study that will be provided by Dr. Nicole Arbor and uh, followed by uh, the TD team uh, lecture on grant writing. So these are our fabulous speakers for today. Dr. Lily House Peters, Dr. Gabriela Alonso Yanez, Marsha Lee Valentine, and Nicole Arbor. And uh, I'm going to present Dr. Nicole. So uh, Nicole Arbor uh, is with the Belmont Forum. She has held several roles in Canada, including Senior Advisor, International Relations at the National Research Council of Canada, Team Lead for the UK Science and Innovation Network in Canada, and she has worked as a research and scientist in the Canadian biotech sector. Nicole is passionate about science communication, science policy, evidence-informed decision-making, and science diplomacy. And uh, if that wouldn't be enough, she also holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Ottawa. And also from a personal side, from working with Nicole, uh, I just recommend everyone to keep their eyes and ears really open to the following lecture because Nicole is an amazing person in terms of recognizing the possibilities for transdisciplinary research and building networks throughout the Americas and beyond uh, to promote these types of approaches uh, in research and practice. So welcome, Nicole. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lila, and uh, thank you, everybody. So I apologize in advance. Uh, mi español es poquito, uh, so I'm going to speak in English, but luckily there's interpretation. Um, I'm also going to ask Lila if she could kindly let me know if I'm speaking too fast at any point, either in the chat uh, or in some other way, because I have a tendency of speaking very rapidly. Um, and so I'm going to try and keep this at a reasonable pace, both for the interpreters and for anyone who's also listening in English. Um, so thank you for inviting me to present. I'm just going to share my screen to get us going, she says, uh, going exactly to the wrong screen to do that. There we go. And once I share that, I will put it on presentation mode. I'm pretty, I'm there we go. All right. So can you see a presentation? I'm looking at Lila for a thumbs up. Yes, perfect. All right. So um, 
basically, thank you for inviting me to present to this course. There's, there's some wonderful work here, and I, I, I hope to uh, have a, an opportunity to explore with Lila and, and the rest of the team at some point how effective this was, because it's, it's a great group, and I'm really excited to be able to use the Belmont Forum as a case study for grant writing, because the more opportunities I have to talk about the Belmont Forum as an opportunity for funding, especially in the transdisciplinary space, hopefully that means the more... Um, really strong applications that we will get uh, to, to have more research in that transdisciplinary international um, context, which is not always, uh, we, we, you can always have more, right? You can always have more. So just to give you a bit of background in the Belmont Forum for anyone who is not familiar with it, the Belmont Forum basically is, a, is an organization that evolved out of necessity. So for those of you who work in any national space, you will recognize that money doesn't cross borders very easily. And so to create international projects can be very challenging. And so the Belmont Forum basically has evolved, has evolved as a mechanism to bring research funders together from different parts of the planet, but who also are allowed are, are in this context working within their own policy structures. So instead of having a common pool of money, what we do is we have different partners, funding partners who come in and who can fund very specific uh, portions of the funding. And so the, the challenge, of course, is to bring all of these partners together around shared projects. And so the way that we do that is we um, we support the Belmont Forum Challenge, which is uh, to support international transdisciplinary research to, to mitigate, adapt, and mitigate and adapt to global environmental change. And within this context, uh, th this, this larger Belmont Forum framework, we're looking for transdisciplinary approaches, uh, that enable us to bring together non-scientific stakeholder communities uh, with researchers to facilitate in a systemic way um, the, uh, the, the research projects that are addressing these challenges. We want there to be collaboration also within that context across scientific disciplines, but really it's about providing flexible mechanisms to support transnational funding in projects or in, in the space where you know, global environmental change transcends all of our geopolitical borders. It's, these are challenges that we're all facing in different parts of the world in different ways, but also in similar ways. So how can we all work together to build towards shared solutions in spaces that, um, that where we're going to need more than one country to be thinking about some of these problems. So the way the Belmont Forum does this is it, it creates what we call collaborative research action. So that's basically, essentially, it's a call for proposals. They're guided through the Belmont Challenge, um, but really they, um, yeah, they, they bring together the different funders into one call. And the the call comes together. I'm just gonna yeah. So the the, the calls are the the priority of the calls is developed by our members. So Belmont Forum structure, uh, which I have here, we have members, we have partners. Um, there's probably more detail here than you need, but the members are the ones who decide the direction of travel. They're the ones who say, okay, well, the priorities that we're seeing at this point are, um, for example, climate, environment, and health, which we are currently building a collaborative research action on and is very relevant to this group. Um, and then the, the, that call is, is, as long as it's agreed to by three members, that this is something that they all agree is worth funding. It will come to the table. We will have a global exercise that helps us to define that problem so that all of the potential participants can see themselves reflected in that call text. So really identifying the, the problem case um, very broadly and globally. Um, and then it will come uh, to, to, be a call, to be a call for proposals through the Belmont Forum process. And the challenge, of course, of, of creating this, uh, when, when it comes to creating a proposal for one of these calls, especially in the context of the Belmont Forum, um, it's really at that bottom level, you're seeing on my slide where we have a consortium and a big circle, it's putting those puzzle pieces together. It's, in, it's, it's identifying the partners that are eligible for funding, and it's thinking about how do you write that proposal in a way that um, really brings to the surface the, um, the excellence of the research and the, the transdisciplinarity of the team. Um, so that it is going to, I'm sorry, there's a noise behind me and I'm not sure how that would affect uh, the, the, what you're hearing. Um, yeah, so, so that you're, that you're creating a consortium that, that, that not only meets the needs of the call that is being put out, but that also 
also is uh, eligible for the funding that has been put together, has been assembled. Belmont Forum, uh, also the way that we've, we've built the system has a few requirements that all of the members have agreed to in order to create uh, research projects that come, that, that, that come together in this global environmental change space. We, because we want truly international projects, we look for collaborators from at least three different countries who are uh, requesting funds from at least three different agencies. Um, honestly, most of the time, there's more countries than just the three that are put into each project. Oftentimes, we're able to get um, very large consortiums, including multiple, uh, more than three countries. Um, we're looking for transdisciplinary uh, projects to be promoted. And so these transdisciplinary projects, we want um, when we're, we're defining this to make it e as easy as possible for the, our, our community, we're looking for natural scientists, we're looking for social scientists, and we're looking for stakeholders to be part of the consortium the, that is being proposed. And that means at, at the very beginning, what we're looking for, and when we say stakeholders, we define that very broadly. It can be policymakers, it can be community members, um, it can be not-for-profit organizations, it can be industry. But it's it, the idea is to create societally relevant research with meaningful co-production so that the stakeholders are involved at the beginning, at the defining of the problem case itself, so that uh, uh, that that it's really societally relevant. It's been helped. Uh, there, there's been identification by the the community itself that this is a challenge that they wish to engage with. They are taken through the process. So it's not just the researchers who are doing all of the research. The society is part of the the, the stakeholders are part of the research itself, and they're getting benefit at the end. So you're really getting that uh, co-production, participatory approaches, um, co-development, and co-implementation. So the Optimally, in a perfect world, that transdisciplinarity goes all the way through the process. Now we recognize that we don't live in a perfect world, um, and that you know transdisciplinarity is something that we're working um, to teach and to integrate into the thought process of of the research community more and more. Um, but we're it's an iterative process. So we're, that's the ultimate goal is to have that co-production from the beginning to the end. Some of the projects we have are amazing and wonderful and have all of these pieces. And more and more we're seeing the development of this research community. And part of that is to provide these opportunities to help uh, people find ways to bring these kinds of projects together. And, and, and it's, it's, it's discussions like these that, that make this possible. Um, and within the context of a Belmont Forum call, while we you have to have sort of the three countries uh, with at least three different requesting funding from at least three different funders. If there are researchers who are not, um, who don't have eligible funding available to them, they can still participate, but they have to participate either by bringing their own funding. So aligning an existing research project perhaps is one way of doing that or by providing in-kind contributions. So what do you need to think about when you're building your Belmont Forum project consortium? So as as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, um, the we do require three different funders. So when you're looking at a funding call, and I'll go through a very specific example afterwards. I'm totally going to pick on the IAI in this one, um, but they should have expected that <laughs> in a good way. Um, you, you you need to identify. You, you need to look at the list of the funders that are presented in a call. And so it, with each Belmont Forum call, we have uh, a list of funders. Um, and each of those funders has a document that we call an annex. And in that annex, it details, and I'll go through one of those uh, with you, it details what the rules of engagement are for that particular funder. Um, in What you're looking for is a, a, a system where you have three different funders. Here you have them listed as funder A, funder B, and funder C. Um, and the, where the consortium leads and the different partners are from different countries. Um, in some annexes, but not all, in some annexes, the funder requires uh, the, the consortium lead to be from their country. I have seen that uh, happen in the past. So it's, it's worth really looking at all of the details and taking the time to pull apart an annex to really understand what each funder requires. And so in, in that context, it's, it's important not to which is, is very easy, it's easy to slip into this trap to look at the funder list and be like, oh, okay, this country, this country, and this country are supported. So I'm just gonna go out and I'm gonna find my part, my friends who are from those individual countries, we're gonna come together, we're gonna build a project. Um, that doesn't always work. 
because sometimes the devil is in the details and you really need to understand that this particular research funder can maybe only fund natural scientists or maybe they can only fund social scientists or maybe although i have yet to see this specifically maybe they could only fund stakeholders i want more of those but i don't have that many of them yet um so really going through and understanding what that looks like same thing with um funding requirements some of them require the institution that receives the funding to be um i know the word they use in the uk is a higher education institution um but some other, other funders can fund anyone. So as long as you're a recognized institution, legal entity, they can fund a not-for-profit, they could fund different types of partners. So understanding who can receive that funding is, is also really important. Um, so, so, so really taking the time at, to, to make sure that you have these three funders in place, or these three pieces in place, um is, is really really important in understanding what each of the funders are looking for to enable that funding and then of course you have to look at the belmont form requirements you have to identify do i have partners that are natural scientists do i have partners that are social scientists and do i have partners that are identified as stakeholders and that's that's a broader base but it's actually often harder for the academic community to identify those stakeholder partners now in in this conversation i'm pretty sure you have a little bit more understanding of what that looks like than perhaps some of the other communities that I've spoken to in the past. So see, these are some of the pieces of, of what you look for in an annex, what countries are supported, who is eligible, so what type of, of, of participant can receive funding from each annex. Some, sometimes our funders contribute in kind and not direct funding. So um, in the context of IAI, for example, for the pathways to sustainability call that happened, um, I think it was in 2020. Uh, they didn't have funding, but they had an in, they had in kind contributions. And so researchers who identified IAI as their partner or as their funding source, they counted as one of the partners, but they didn't receive direct funding. They would they're eligible to receive support in other ways um, from IAI. And, and sometimes that is through creating linkages, um, so through through, uh, th through through different types of, of activities that the IAI supports. Um, there's oft, often also a funding cap. Uh, if you request too far above the funding cap, your project becomes ineligible because the, the researcher the community will look at the call and will say, oh, well, you know, we're only putting in, for example, perhaps $50,000, you've requested $500,000, if it's a decimal place that you've accidentally misplaced, it's not a problem. But if you are requesting $500,000, but only eligible for 50, you probably won't be able to do the research that you said you're gonna do in your project. Um, and so really understanding what that maximum is, is super important. Uh, what is the duration? Um, where to submit the proposal? So we have one grant operating system, everything has to go through that. But sometimes some funders also request that it be submitted in parallel so that they have it in their system as well. So for example, FAPESP is one of our partners who request that the funding, the, the grant is submitted through BFCO, but it is also submitted through the FAPESP system. Um, and then of course, there's sometimes the stipulations, oops, uh, stipulations for the number of researchers in the consortium. Remembering the currency is important. So each annex is not written in US dollars or euros. Uh, or any other specific currency. So making sure that you're you're paying attention to currency conversions. Uh, and of course, the GPC point of contact. There's always someone who is identified in each annex as the person to ask questions. And I would encourage anyone who is trying to develop a grant proposal to use those people to your advantage. They're there to answer your questions. If anything is unclear at any point in time, send emails. Um, it's, it's really important to be flexible or to, to, to be willing to reach out. So now I'm going to pull apart a, a very specific annex. Um, like I said, I'm picking on the IAI because it makes sense in this context. The IAI was part of our recent call on um, migration. So they submitted uh, an annex. And this is, uh, I, I pulled apart the key points, the things that I think are really important for you to look at when you're looking for an annex. So for example, in this particular call, for which was for human migration, um, the IAI supported 
Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, specifically Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, except Sao Paulo. And that was only because FIFPESC was also part of the call. So those researchers had available funding. Uh, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica. Anyways, there's, the, there's, there's quite a, a list here of, of eligible countries who could have come together. But the thing to remember that IAI is one funder. They're not multiple funders. So even if you put three, three countries together from that list, this is still only part of the eligibility criteria necessary to come together to, uh, to participate in a Belmont Forum call. You still would have needed to find two other funders in this context who would have been who would be able to support that call. Um, in this case, uh, they would were providing three years of funding or in-kind support. And normally it's actually and or with the IAI. Um, and one eligible country could apply for up to 50,000 US dollars. Um, two with, so with two, you could have 100, or with three or more, up to 150. So each of the projects could have asked for a total of 150,000 US dollars um, per project. So that, that, that requested funding. They could also request in kind support instead of funding. Um, and they wanted the, the, teams, the preference would be for teams who were led by individuals who are members of groups that have been historically underrepresented. Um, so that, uh, that, that the idea there is to support those research communities that often don't have that opportunity. So they're, they're the end. Um, and IAI funded researchers could be either listed as the lead uh, researcher or as a co-PI or partner on the proposal. And researchers could be a senior personnel on up to two proposals. So there could be at least there could be up to two projects that would have had the same researchers um, submitted at the same time. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, I, one of the things that um, IAI requested in their uh, annex that was different than the others is that they also required teams to include an equity, diversity, and inclusion plan within their proposal. So this isn't, um, this is one of those things that I'm hoping that we will make more common within the context of the Belmont Forum, but that's not uniformly required by all funders. And so this is, this is actually something I'm getting to and moving towards with my membership community. Um, but in the context of the, the IAI grant uh, proposal or the annex, um, it is a requirement. So if you, th this is something that you, you have to see. If you don't look through the annex and notice that there has to be an EDI plan. If you don't have your EDI plan in present, then your project can be deemed ineligible. So that's that's an important thing to consider. Um, IAI also had a, a, a line item that said that, that all applications should align with IAI's policies, strategic plan, and scientific agenda, and that they made it easy. They added in all of those links. Um, but again, it it's taking the time to go through all of the documents. So this isn't, you know, we. Working in an international setting is never easy. We try to make it as easy as possible, but the context is still, it's still challenging when you're trying to bring together different agencies who have different requirements and different, um, different pieces uh, as part of that. So if you just, so, so if you take that one step deeper and I'm not gonna go too deep because I know we have lots of time and you can ask all sorts of detailed questions after if you like. Um, but here's here's just a couple of line items that, you know, if you were looking at this and you're like, OK, well, how do I think about drafting my grant application? OK, well, I have to have all of these things in. Oh, now I have to look at the policies. I have to put an EDI, EDI plan together. Where do I find the EDI policy? You look at the EDI policy in this context. What is IAI trying to achieve with this EDI policy? I'm pretty sure Lila is very familiar with some of the wording that she's seeing on the screen right now. But that's really looking at, you know, mainstreaming um, science, IAI science projects uh, to include EDI as all part of them. So facilitating full and equitable participation of underrepresented groups, supporting regional efforts uh, and improving capacity of government. So there's lots of wonderful stuff in here. Um, and that's, I mean, that that basically covers, that's a, it's a bit of a deep dive into one annex, but you have to keep in mind that for a research proposal, um, a, a project to go into the Belmont Forum, you need to look at all of the relevant annexes. You need to understand what the rules of engagement are for each of those three, at least three funders that you're looking to receive funding for. Because if the easiest way to have a project disqualified from the system 
is that it doesn't actually meet the eligibility requirements of the funders from whom it is seeking funding. Um, so that's that 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 makes it very challenging. Um, but within that context, so if you if you follow those rules of engagement, if you if you take the time to really understand who the eligible partners are, and like I said, if you're if there's at any point, if there's confusion, you go straight to that contact point. Each of the funders has a contact point. It's part of the process. They have to identify someone whose role it is to identify and engage with any questions that come from that community. Uh, and normally those people are able to support those communities in the language of that community so that you're, you know, the, the Belmont Forum language of operation is in English. We try to be more flexible where possible, but uh, I, my, my, and I'm working on my Spanish, but it's not there yet. Um, but the, the different funding institutions definitely are able to engage with their community. Um, within the Belmont form process, though, that, that once you've got, once you've got through the annexes, once you've decided, pulled together your team of researchers and stakeholders um, that meet that definition of uh, social scientists, natural scientists, scientists and stakeholders that uh, come from three different countries that are eligible for funding through the annexes, then it's the review process. And so really in this context for the Belmont Forum, our panel of experts is nominated by all participating funders. And so when we bring those funders together to, to join the call, we ask them all to nominate experts normally within their community, but many of them have international um, uh, international partners. Lila, I'm looking at your face and I'm wondering, is the sound clear or is the wind making this difficult? It was sounding quite clear. Just right now, it got a little bit less. Okay. So Clear to hear. Okay, I think it's better now, but if it just, just let me know, I might end up putting my hood, it'll cover the headphones. I'll look a little funnier though, in which case I apologize in advance. Um, so yeah, so the panel of experts is nominated by all the different participating funders. So they'll reach out to their, they won't necessarily reach out, but they'll nominate experts from their community to come together into one shared reviewed process, which is also a very valuable part of the Belmont form process because it means that you're not going through five different review processes or three different review processes. Um, you're able to do this in in one single point so you you don't have that double jeopardy where you're applying to one country they say yes but then the other uh researcher in your party is applying to another country and they they, they say no um in this case it all comes together and when a project comes through the review process successfully it's funded by all the partners that um that, that the, the funding was submitted to so there's one single review panel and in this context the review is based on uh for the belmont forum sort of three main pieces. There's the quality and intellectual merit. There is the fit to call objectives, because obviously the call has a defined call text. And then there's sort of the personnel quality and the quality of transdisciplinarity. Um, what I didn't put in here is there's also an open, there's, there's considerations um, in, in the review descriptions. There's also considerations for things like uh, open data and fair data there has to be a data plan uh, data and digital objects management plan submitted as part of the belmont forum call so this is also a very important consideration um, that i probably should have added on this slide and we'll add for the future slides the for future use of this slide um, so so these are all but but these are the things that that we're looking for uh, and that we're going we're asking our reviewers to really pull apart when they're reviewing um, each project and so once it comes through this, this review process, that's when the, the, the successful projects um, get their funding. So, you know, why would you work through the Belmont Forum as a funder? So why, why do all my funders come together to hang out with us? It's not only because we're really fun, and we are, um, but it's because it's a trusted collaborative process that has been going on for 12 years. We've had over 150 different members and funders come through this process, uh, which says a lot about the process, actually. It's been refined over the years. Um, but it, overall, despite the challenges associated with bringing together many international partners, it's been successful. Um, we've done 19 of these collaborative research actions, like the, the ones that have been described. Uh, and it is a single point of entry, which makes it a lot easier when you're trying to just to, to build international projects. Um, once uh, agreed upon, uh, one it's, it's one agreed upon transdisciplinary process, but we also build community through this process. So, so not only are there activities like this 
uh, that the, the uh, but when when our collaborative research actions, each act uh, each one as they come together as the projects are awarded, you have kickoff meetings, midterm meetings, and enter meetings that are all mandated by the Belmont Forum process. So that brings together the the all the individual projects within a, a collaborative research action to share um, to to share understanding to share. Uh, best practice and to learn from one another and hopefully to create other opportunities to collaborate. Uh, and so that's three different times in throughout the course of that funding process um, that that these groups are, are mandated to come together. In the, in the pre-COVID world, this was always done in person, obviously in a COVID world that was done all virtually. And I suspect that in a post-COVID or as close we, as we are to that, now, that will probably remain hybrid for the next little while, but it's a great opportunity to build that community, to, to share um, with one another and to create networks uh, in the transdisciplinary space. And then um, the Melmont Forum is also involved in convening the, uh, the broader transdisciplinary community um, in collaboration with Future Earth at the annual Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress, which we host a, a, every year. This year, it's going to be in Panama in collaboration with II and Senesit. And this is another opportunity for us to bring together the, the overall thematics of uh, a, 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 a very broad group of people, of um, practitioners in the transdisciplinary space um, to bring together some of the stakeholders who have been successfully part of these projects. So the Belmont Forum is, is about funding really wonderful and groundbreaking research, but it's also about creating community and really um, supporting and developing that societally relevant research base. So creating those links between science and society, some of the things that I really love. It's great to work in a research organization that does all of the things you love. Um, so if I mean, I, I'm obviously going to stay and answer all of the questions, um, but if you wanted to follow uh, uh, any uh, research calls that are coming up, we have lots of ways that you can, you know, get information from us. I will also, my email is at the bottom there if you want to email me directly. Uh, by all means, if you email me in Spanish, I will run it through DeepL and I will reply to you in Spanish, but I make no promises that the translations are going to be good. Um, so you'll just have to be patient with me. Um, and then, of course, we welcome you all to join us at SRI in Panama. Uh, the call for contributions is now open, and we'd love to see as much of the Americas community as possible to join us. We're going to be in the Americas, and it's time to celebrate all of the wonderful research uh, that happens here. And so with that, I will end my presentation and hand the baton over to whoever is next and be available for questions. I think... You said, Lila, that you're going to do questions after both presentations. Is that right? Yes. So we have 15 minutes at the end of the session to have questions that should be addressed to both you and uh, the to Lily and Gabriela that are also here, because since the, the two presentations are really interconnected, it, it's possible that some questions are going to be uh, to um, the three of you or two of you. So it's a better way of um, in, um, to make the most of our time here. And also I uh, remember the participants that we probably won't have time to answer all the questions live. So we are going to pick and choose some more uh, some questions that are more expressive or broader, and then we can have answers for the specific ones uh, that we can send the answers to your mailboxes as we did in previous sessions. So thank you so much, Nicole. I think that the example of the Belmont Forum is a, a, a really great opportunity. Uh, I can understand that some people get a little bit scared about the, the um, immense amount of acronyms that are used and um, the ways that... I'm so that sorry. I forgot about the acronyms. I normally <laughs> try to be more sensitive to that. And then I just looked at the chat and I realized I really did a bad job of deacroniming. I apologize. 
but but that's also part of of the game uh starting to learn the different acronyms and how they follow so this is a, an important part of the job of grant writing is understanding the call really well and to understand that you have to understand the funder as well so i think your presentation brings a lots of insights that someone just poking around the Belmont Forum, my, uh, the Belmont Forum site could not have uh, the, this clear picture that you have provided us. So thank you so much. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Dr. Lily House Peters and Dr. Gabriel Alonso. If you can please, hello. Welcome, I'll just pass on the floor to you and then we'll have some time for questions in the end. Um, good morning, um, Lily House Peters. I believe Gabriella is uh, here as well, and we will be presenting the final session of the transdisciplinary um, kind of background, um, thinking about the concept note. So for the sake of time, um, what we would really like to focus on, or one element, is the piece of the concept note, which also Nicole Arbor's presentation focused on, which is thinking about and being sure to integrate clearly um, into the transdisciplinary research um, element and the concept note, how the, um, how the project will utilize equitable, diverse and inclusive research strategies. And so here uh, we just wanna spend a few minutes uh, talking about and introducing IAI's um, equity, diversity and inclusivity uh, strategy. And um, we have here and we can share the, the direct links, but um, the English and Spanish uh, versions of this policy. And so, the IAI science agenda calls for the engagement of diverse stakeholders through transdisciplinary science at all stages of knowledge production. And this is from the research funding through the design, through the implementation and the dissemination and communication of your results. And so um, this is a really important piece of the concept note that you're currently working uh, with your teams to develop is thinking about from the beginning stages of your research through community engagement, um, through the knowledge mobilization and dissemination pieces, how um, you will ensure that the research is equitable, that it's inclusive of diverse um, identities, diverse uh, groups of people, both in terms of your research team composition, but also um, community engagement, and then how the results are shared. And um, we know from many reports that exist, uh, many articles that historic and persistent inequalities um, and underrepresentation of, spe of specific groups uh, continues to be a persistent problem in knowledge production and knowledge circulation in the Americas. And so we wanna be careful um, to not continue to reproduce this problem, but instead to move beyond it with this work. Um, so for the sake of time, um, we also want to draw attention to where, um, I think there's a microphone there, uh, draw attention to, in addition to the IEI, this movement globally towards a more open science. Um, and so here you see from UNESCO in 2021, their open science declaration. And this acknowledges or recognizes that open science should not only foster enhanced sharing of scientific knowledge among just the scientific community, but also really promote inclusion and exchange of scholarly knowledge from traditionally underrepresented or excluded groups, including women, so thinking about gender here, minorities, indigenous scholars, scholars from less advantaged countries and low resource languages. Um, and contribute to reducing inequalities and in access to scientific development, infrastructure, and capabilities among different countries and regions. So following the IEI's EDI policy and the kind of UNESCO's um, open science, we wanted to just um, share a little bit about 
uh, the three pillars, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this language is taken from the IAI's policy and the overarching kind of concept of intersectionality. And um, make sure that as you're thinking with your projects and developing your projects, uh, you're considering where each of these elements or pillars can be included. Um, and then being sure that 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 aspect of your concept note is, is strong um, and clear and well-developed. So um, intersectionality, kind of the umbrella concept here, um, and this frame refers to what is really a systemic or structural marginalization and disadvantage at the intersection of multiple different identities. And so here we're thinking about where, for example, gender, might intersect with other identities um, such as age, socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, religion, disability, um, language, et cetera, and how the, this intersection can cause some groups to have kind of more power and be overrepresented, especially in science and in research. This includes in research leadership, so not only um, the composition of your team overall, but who are the PIs and co-PIs? Um, what is the gender balance there? What is uh, the different kind of intersection of identities um, across kind of your research team? And then also in terms of the communities that you're engaging, um, the communities that your research is focused on and how knowledge is going to be mobilized or communicated to diverse groups um, so that there is kind of an equity um, focus in who benefits from the research. Um, equity itself refer refers to removing these systemic barriers and biases. So thinking about how all individuals can have equal opportunity to access and benefit from the research. Um, diversity in green represents the differences in age, sex, sexual orientation, ability, gender, um, et cetera, et cetera. So really thinking about how to take advantage of um, composing a diverse team or a team that includes diverse identities. Um, and then also that the research is engaging diverse communities. And finally, inclusion in pink, that pillar is the practice of ensuring that all individuals are valued and respected for their contributions and are receiving support um, and are integrated into all phases of the scientific process. So um, this is kind of to think about how these different pillars will be represented um, and built into your work. Okay. Um, and briefly here, just to uh, summarize the IAI's policy, the focus here is to really mainstream equity, diversity, and inclusion in research. Um, and here, an example is thinking about your gender balance in your team composition, as well as your research leadership, as just one, one small example of how this uh, could play out. Also, being sure to really facilitate full and equitable participation of underrepresented groups um, in science and supporting regional efforts to develop high quality science um, and improve the capacity as well of policy and government uh, relevant to global environmental change. And so um, as you are writing your concept notes, please be aware of the IAI's EDI plan and take into consideration um, clearly how you will address EDI in your research. Um, okay, and we're happy to answer um, additional questions about that as well. And um, Finally here, just a few best practices that we've found in our research experience and in the literature for um, integrating EDI in research. And really it's beginning with this as an intentional focus. So being sure that research teams are purposefully and deliberately diverse, that this isn't an accident, but that it's actually planned from the beginning how these elements will be included. Um, Thinking as well at times about diverse, um, sorry, demographic diversity. So there we have all of the different kind of identity categories, but also thinking about cognitive diversity. And we found in transdisciplinary um, teamwork 
that having differences in thought and insights and perspectives and uh, conceptual frameworks uh, is also really important piece of this diversity and can really help um, teams to think in new ways about problems by having you know, a diverse kind of group of thinkers. So not everybody thinking about the project or the problem in the exact same way. Um, also taking into account that this takes time, that increasing diversity within an existing team, or if you're creating a new team, um, that it does take time, it does take thought, and it does take effort to do this well. Um, so don't just think this is a quick add-on. Um, it is something that needs to really be well thought out um, from the beginning. And that's part of what this concept note will really allow um, your team to do is to consider um, how this will happen. Also, you really wanna be thinking about empowering underrepresented groups, not tokenizing them, not just adding them as an extra because you have to have that diversity, but how are you then going to empower people to be successful in the research and to take an important role in that research. Um, and then again, thinking about that overarching concept of intersectionality um, and how that might influence the power dynamics in your research team and really being careful not to reproduce marginalization. And that might even be in terms of how resources flow in your project, the budget, the finances, um, who, you know, which researchers might get larger amounts of a budget or which communities might be more represented or less represented in the research. Um, and then finally, we have found that trying to really decentralize knowledge claims from not only being within academia, so moving out of this ivory tower model and thinking about a science that is much more inclusive and open is also very helpful because sometimes uh, the academic process of research or academic uh, training itself um, may actually inhibit some of this uh, openness or some of this diversity. So these are some uh, recommendations. And now I'm going to, oh, actually we have a quick Zoom poll um, here in English, and then you'll see it in Spanish pop up, but um, use that to help you. So um, please pick a choice and then uh, I'll pass the word to, to Gabriella, who will speak a little bit about um, a communication tool within Teams. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think we are beginning to see that um, all of the answers are correct, which means that um, E, all of the above, but if you selected any of the answers, um, then these are all these are all true. So keep that in mind. Um, with that, uh, Gabriella, if you would like to speak about the uh, collaboratorios. Sí, gracias, Lili. Um, hola a todos, animo. Thank you, Lily. Uh, it's great to see you again. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Lourdes and Anna, for interpreting today. And also, Anna and Haley for their support, you know, uh, uh, in the backstage preparation of the, of the workshop. Lily has said many important things. And I'd, I'd also like to comment on Nicole's presentation. She talked about strategies that must be significant when it comes to knowledge co-production and participation in research. I think this is one of the aspects that we have been addressing throughout the course. You have mentioned this work, you know, participatory approaches. So this is connected to strategies you already apply, you know, actual participation, learning models, etc. So it's the same thing when we talk about integrating all this, especially when it comes to knowledge co-production from an EDI perspective. 
This is a specific example of our work. As Lily have said, this example is based on our experience, but also it is based on research. We have studied the social media. We have studied how different stakeholders, how different TV stakeholders interact. So we have created this uh, community of practice collaboratorios. Do you remember Pennington's article? You know, this community of practice uh, collaboratories. Pennington talks about this community learning and he talks about this approach. There is this social learning approach and the, that is a theoretical basis. There are two ways of viewing learning. First of all, individual learning, you know, psychologically, biologically, and this contrasts with social learning, where we assume that learning is built collectively. So these communities of practice collaboratories are based on this approach. They specifically uh, address uh, collaboration um, models based on learning communities. I think you know this model already. And also the response communities. I think Rayana's question is very interesting. She says that there are many stakeholders that are not very close to science. How do we get them closer to science? Okay, maybe uh, when we think about science, when we think about knowledge and teams and the kind of knowledge and the type of pro, uh, knowledge production protocol that are protocols that are validated and relevant to our project. I think that should be the question. And this really, uh, you know, uh, illustrates what Lily was saying about decentralizing the academic world, you know, and providing new knowledge protocols. As Nicole has said, um, there is something is, re uh, there is this learning process, which is an iterative process. It changes, it evolves. Some people talk about loop learning, Others talk about talking to the team. Uh, next one, please. And here we have the example of our work. This is the model um, on the right. We put together the practice communities for this project. Another interesting strategy is called regressive planning. This is used in education, in planning for primary schools or elementary schools, and in high school as well. And the idea is to have backward planning. So you start from the logical model we introduced last session. You set yourself your aims. And then you have, you know, ethical decisions, funding, team organization, etc. Therefore, you develop a collaborative work model. As you remember from the case we have mentioned many times, and this is the, the project we are now implementing with the IAI. There are four countries. Each country had a leading team formed by researchers, people from the community and graduate students. And here you can see the structure of our work to, to start backwards uh, from our objectives to our teamwork with constant communication. I think it's important, as Lily was saying, to think of this not, not just as a token, but um, the diversity as a constant exercise that runs parallel with whatever research you're conducting. So we have different descriptions of our work meetings with our whole team, meetings by country. Uh, next slide, please. Something that was very interesting is that our practice community actions, they, they changed from what we had planned at the beginning. So at a certain point and the, during the process, one of those practices was focused on creative writing in communities because one of the results we wanted to have was a book 
that not just uh, to capture not just academic uh, discourse, but um, different narratives in, in prose and in verse. And, and they asked for us for that. So that collaboration focused on that, on, on come, uh, creating that book as a deliverable for our, our group. And hopefully we will soon be able to share the link with you because it's being edited right now. I think that was the last slide, Lily, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, we have another Zoom vote quote. Choose up to two uh, options. Sí, yo envío, Lili, yo enviamos información sobre planeación regresiva. Lili and I will send you, yes, information of regressive planning. Um, okay, I think uh, we've um, had a moment for the poll. So uh, here we see actually very interesting that um, the the responses with the most uh, where people feel ready to integrate into the research design, more equitable and inclusive research engagement. That's excellent. Um, as well as co-production of knowledge with policymakers and engaging local communities. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing those um, as well as the other, um, the other choices in, in the concept notes. Okay, um, we're coming into our last kind of 10 minutes uh, before the question. So unfortunately today, um, Marsha Lee was unable to join us, but wanted to talk just a little bit about um, finishing up the case of Jawick, Jamaican women in coffee. And here we see, interestingly, um, many of the kind of theories and tenets and ideas of transdisciplinary research um, through this case study. And so importantly, um, what we see here is how they've worked to create a shared vision and to build or generate kind of trust. And this was uh, really important in terms of the community engagement piece of this research of having kind of multiple engagements with communities, um, not only just going to a community once and kind of extracting information from that community, but actually returning to the community to share results, um, to share kind of what they learned through the survey, uh, to share best practices learned through the research, um, and to really co-produce this shared vision and this shared research. Um, and so this also really helped to establish clear objectives um, for trainings that were delivered both to this community and other um, similar communities of coffee, um, coffee producers, and to um, ensure that kind of those materials were designed um, in collaboration with communities. Um, you can see how they've explicitly included their farmers. So um, those who they're doing kind of research about, but also research with importantly here um, in actually developing training material and um, kind of encourage this active participation um, kind of throughout the case study. And so thinking about how that community engagement can be really deep um, and bringing, you know, communities into also, you know, co-develop materials or evaluate materials um, for feedback so that they can be as well kind of um, as well designed for the community as possible. And um, also something I want to speak to on this slide is really how important this is in terms of monitoring and evaluation. 
Um, so kind of the last um, column over here, but a lot of the tools, including going back a few weeks to talking about the results uh, chain, that logic model of backwards planning, um, as Gabriella was just speaking about kind of the backwards planning um, in the collaboratories uh, the, of practice, the CPC model, but thinking at the beginning about how monitoring and evaluation of your project, of your research is going to happen throughout the process and building in the monitoring and the project evaluation um, from the beginning. So this isn't something that's just kind of checked off at the end. And um, as you're designing your concept notes, be kind of thinking about how is that monitoring and evaluation going to happen? Um, and then also how is the dissemination of the results going to happen as well? And this can also be a place thinking about equity and um, inclusion and diversity to actually build a leadership capacity and um, mentorship of uh, within communities or of uh, members of your own research team so that you're seeing kind of this mentorship and this development happen as well as part of a, a research project. So you can see the kind of multi-beneficial ways that actually taking equity, diversity, and inclusion um, seriously can, uh, can improve your science and improve your project and improve the outcomes, um, and especially around knowledge mobilization. Um, thinking about how different voices may be able to um, impact communities and speak to communities. And Marjali also uh, briefly wanted to speak a little bit to some of the ways that in the Jawick case, um, conflict was managed. And if you uh, remember, we talked about uh, conflict as something that is going to happen in most teams. Um, and that conflict does not have to be destructive. It can become destructive if it's not managed, if it's just kind of ignored um, or people do not feel seen or heard or included. Um, but conflict can also be very productive and can strengthen a team um, if they can move through it in a, in a positive way. And so um, some of the conflicts that were identified and managed in the uh, project life cycle for the Jawick case study in Jamaica was um, the, the conflict that they were seeing were between farming communities, between agriculture uh, workers, so the farmers themselves, and between the farmers and the uh, regulatory authorities. And some of the ways that they managed conflict was actually to um, segregate the trainings by community. So thinking about, um, you know, should, should trainings happen among everybody? Should they happen separately? Who should be engaged um, there? Encouraging group work and discussion. And this can be really important because actually allowing people to hear how problems are framed or solutions are framed, um, which might be different, to be able to talk through these conflicting areas um, can be very helpful, as well as building trust. So learning together can be a very important way to build trust. Um, having meetings together where people can share openly, can get to know each other, um, and can build friendships or relationships also helps with that trust building. And when you get a conflict um, that arises, if you have that trust amongst team members, that can really help for navigating the conflict in a positive way because people are willing to say, that might not be my view, but I trust this person and I'm willing to try to see the problem through their eyes and see if we can come together um, in a useful way. And um, Finally, thinking about, in this case, um, how to select kind of trainers um, or how to select members of the team to engage who are familiar either with the community or with the local context or with the problem um, as other ways to kind of manage um, conflict, in this case, more around community engagement. And for the sake of questions, um, we're going to encourage um, you to watch the uh, kind of last 10 minutes of Martine's video, but today we'd like to give the full 15 minutes to questions. So um, you can access the PowerPoints uh, with the video link on the website. And um, that talks, the second part of the video talks about a case study in New Zealand 
um, working with the Maori community and overcoming um, some research issues and how to kind of move forward the best with that. So we, we encourage you to watch that 10 minutes um, after the session. And oops, finally, um, just our contact information here as well. We encourage you to stay in contact. Uh, we're on Twitter. You can follow our uh, research team, TV Research Lab, uh, Jawick, um, Marshallese organization, um, or uh, some of us who are there personally. We also have a website um, with presence on Facebook and Instagram. And so we look forward um, to continuing our kind of sustained engagement. And thank you so much for your time through these seven weeks. So at this point, I think we can turn over to, to Q&A uh, with Nicole as well. Thank you so much, Lily and Gabriela. That was an amazing presentation also with uh, as in all other sessions that has been provided by you, uh, many insights on uh, many insights on how to move forward and how to uh, apply a, to the approach in practice. So I'm going to bring up some uh, questions to both of you and also to Nicole. Uh, and I'll seek to make the, the questions that are most comprehensive and that were not addressed in the chat somehow, uh, reasserting that we can uh, provide some insights uh, in writing after the session today. So um, to Nicole, uh, I'd like to um, bring together some questions that, that were related to uh, the topics that the Belmont Forum Collaborative Research Actions address, especially in terms of what's upcoming for next year. So uh, three of our attendees today made questions related to the, to the topics that are covered in the calls and what, it, what, it, what they should expect. Uh, do you want me to tackle it now? Yes. Okay. Just yes, sure. and then so, and then I'll I'll pass on to the other group, and we can try to make two questions each if we have the time, or one question each if we can, if we don't. Perfect. All right. So you guys uh, have got me at a fortuitous moment because the Belmont Forum plenary was last week. So all of my members agreed to what's coming up in 2023. So in 2023, as may have already been hinted at or strongly suggested, or maybe even made very blunt, uh, we will have climate, environment and health too, uh, as a call for proposals that is has agreed is, is ready to go. So we do have that one. Um, there's still discussions on the timelines for that, but that one is now ready, has been agreed, is, is ready for, for launch. We have a second call on urban blue and green spaces. So this is really examining the parks, the water uh, ways, the, 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 all those green and blue spaces within communities and how they can be used to um, with and by the communities uh, in, in um, mitigating uh, climate uh, challenges, in improving health. So it's, it's actually quite a, a broad call in that context. There's lots of opportunities for engagement, but it's really looking at the benefits of those blue and green spaces in our communities. Um, and then the third call, exactly, thank you, Lila. Um, and then the third call that has been agreed uh, to take forward is on climate and cultural heritage. So this is looking at a bunch of different intersections on climate and cultural heritage, um, mostly the impact of climate on cultural heritage, but that can be cultural heritage in the in in the, the perspective from the perspective of like UNESCO heritage sites for one example, but it can also be cultural heritage um, in a more sort of uh, like the, the way the community has to adapt uh, because their traditional ways of working or engaging with the land around them. Um, is changing. So it's, it's again, there's, we tried to um, scope these calls so that multiple partners can see themselves reflected in them and we can get um, the most hopefully awesome projects out of them as possible. Um, the, the, I'm noticing that there's where can we find more information. They will become available as, um, as we have more clear information on the timelines and stuff. So we will I'll be making that available to people. We're also always continuing to look for 
funders who might be interested in funding because as you might have guessed from the presentation the people who participate in the calls uh, the researchers who are eligible for funding basically depends entirely on which funders choose to fund any given call and those funders can be belmont forum members but often they won't fund all the calls in one year they can also be partners you don't need to be a belmont forum member to come in and fund a specific call so if there's a funding institution that says oh my goodness climate and cultural heritage is super important to us we actually have money that we would like to put towards this they can come and join the call the same uh, as the members they just don't get to uh, they they're, they're they just have to provide us an annex what are the rules of engagement with your funding institution um so it's that's that's the beauty of the belmont forum system is that we try to make it as inclusive and welcoming as possible for all possible funders to get the most international projects possible and to fund the most researchers possible um so that's uh that's this year they're still in development very quickly uh we're working on an africa regional call we are working on a call that um so towards the development, these are not calls that will happen next year, of Amazon and tropical forests, which is particularly potentially of value to this group. We're looking at a call on pathways to sustainability, which will examine this, the intersection of the sustainable development goals. Um, we are looking at a call on, um, did I say Africa Regional? I might have already said that one. Uh, sorry, uh, and uh, we had just had agreement to take forward sustainability and peace building or environmental peace building and one that is going to be multiple calls on urban um uh, defining urban transitions so that one will be a longer term piece but these ones i just mentioned are 2024 and further so we're still in the defining the questions working with the community to identify what the challenges are so that it's, it's quite um, early in the face space, but as you were asking, where are we going? What does that look like? That's about what that looks like right now. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, uh, so to Lily and Gabriela, I'll try to do the same and uh, address to you the questions that are most recurrent. Uh, I've seen that Gabriela also have already responded somehow some of these questions, but would you care to comment uh, live a little bit further on the instruments to address uh, the necessity of inclusion? So many questions go around the tools that you have used to actually make an environment where participation is not just uh, something that's in the project, but something that actually involves and engages the, the local communities that you have worked with or that you're planning to work with. Do you want to start, Gabby, and then I can... Yes, Lily. Um... Well, I think something that's interesting about all questions is that we're going, uh, we're having a deeper conversation about what it means to generate knowledge. Something that is interesting is like when we go to a workshop and the workshop is about how to integrate people of African descent. And we think we're going to learn how to integrate people of African descent, but it's actually an ongoing conversation. And so it brings me hope how we understand uh, knowledge generation protocols is something that is changing right now. Science is not the only uh, knowledge generation protocol that informs the, there are different sources to uh, address the complex issues that we have right now. So when you have that perspective, that mindset, that the knowledge protocol is diverse, then the question on how can you make sure to, to make that uh, integration process work, that goes into the background because I trust, I believe that the knowledge that I can generate in the academia isn't the only one and it's limited. Therefore, working with the communities, local community, public policy sectors, people from the funding agencies, etc. 
And if I do this, I have a more open perspective, you know, someone has to help me do that. And I think that might be part of the answer as well. And also, uh, thank you for your uh, for many comments. I know many of you are already doing this work, but maybe now there is, you know, this space that uh, that legitimates this, you know, um, uh, as Roberto is saying, now we uh, validate ancestral knowledge. And these people have, have always known how to do things, but now we are, you know, um, connecting the money, the funds, uh, uh, to get results and also this project. Now we are finding this connection and that's part of the answer as well, Laila. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Gabriela. Lily, please go ahead. Um, one of the things that I would kind of say um, to them, it's maybe hard to say exactly a, a tool, but um, in the community kind of engagement to the extent possible where your team can, it might be through surveys or through focus groups, um, but where your, or participant observation even, um, but to the, to the extent possible where your team can understand the local context um, as well as how the people present are understanding the problem and the types of either knowledge or solutions that they you know, want, to, want to get. So in Jawick's case, uh, they've been very successful with surveys um, of, their, of their communities and understanding in that way how context might differ amongst communities even facing similar problems um, around coffee production and climate change and environmental change. Um, in other cases, as we saw in Colombia, it was actually uh, facilitating workshops with local people where they were given kind of very simple templates, but asked them, what is the problem from your view and what kinds of knowledge do you need? What kinds of solutions are you looking for? And your team may not be able to provide every solution for every um, community, but it will help to make your research um, and especially the impact of your research so much um, kind of more impactful if you actually really understand the problem um, from the perspective of the communities and what they are looking for um, in that knowledge. And so uh, it is definitely a balance between some of the more scientific research um, kind of ways modeling or other kinds of data that you might be utilizing. But if you are not thinking about the local context or not thinking about the needs of people who are present, the solutions that you come up with in just the research might actually not really have any impact because communities may not be open um, to those types of solutions. And then you find you do research, but it doesn't have that, that transformative impact. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, so uh, to wrap up here, I'd like to seek to translate a little bit the last question made by Diana to a question that I could address to, to the three of you, because I think you have a, a great amount of experience in trying to uh, deal with those types of challenges that she uh, uh, puts to the table here. She says, from my experience, the the in transdisciplinary uh, research, I think that one of the biggest challenges is the undervalorization of the ancestral or heritage knowledge. And then, uh, according to academia, they look at that knowledge as something that hasn't uh, enough scientific embasement. It's not evidence. It's not understood as evidence. So um, to take on uh, her, her challenge and to seek to address on one or two minutes each of you, how in your experience was this process of trying to incorporate local knowledges in scientific research in uh, what was the translation process like to the Belmont Forum, to both you, Lily, and Gabriela as researchers that are really well experienced in the, the, applying it to the approach? 
Uh, what are the main challenges of this translation and how did you try to overcome them? I know that this question is not answerable in one or two minutes, but I'd like to, to hear your main insights on this question. Nicole, if you would care to start, please. I was going to say, I think it's easier for me to start because I have less very specific examples, um, but more sort of where we try to lead the community, because you're absolutely right. This is a this is a huge challenge um, uh, and it's, it's about a culture change, too. It's about a culture change within the academic ivory tower. It's about recognizing that your way of thinking and your way of doing are not always the only ways and, and recognizing that there are many different ways of knowing. Um, and so this is something that is part of the ongoing Belmont Forum dialogue. Um, and so the, the, the you know, I, there are very specific individual projects. So there's, there's, there's quite a number of Belmont Forum projects where this has been done well. Um, I'm sure there are also, uh, if I looked for them, examples of where this is done less well. Um, but the idea in, in the context sort of at the, the, the thousand foot level that I look at is really to make sure that in the conversations that we have, in the trainings that we have, in the, 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 the way that we support the community, it's to, to maintain the line uh, and, and the, 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 to remind people that the important part is to be inclusive, to, to, to recognize that your way of knowing is not the only way of knowing. Um, but it's, it's reinforcing that message because it, it doesn't matter if you're an early career scientist, a mid-career scientist, or a late career scientist, everybody needs to remember to respect one another, to respect the, the information um, and the knowledge that is being shared with them and to recognize that um, all, all of these pieces have value. So it's not a perfect system by a long shot. Um, and we've got a ways to go, but as long as I feel like as long as we continue, you know, working with the communities, uh, particularly the research communities to understand and, and recognize the value of different ways of knowing, we're, we're getting there slowly but surely, but I'm going to move it on to the other experts who are probably more experts than me, Gabrielle and Lily, who have uh, probably more on the ground experience. Thank you, Nicole. Please, Gabriela. Sí, yo creo que el, o sea, hay, hay como varios niveles. Y uno I es, think there are several levels, and um, there is the, the individual level, for instance. Uh, if I'm doing something, I need to be sure of it. And we talked about transdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinarity as a way of life, and that that is much more personal, you know. I I have found it very useful to read uh, different thinkers that think about what it means to be brown or the history of colonization in Latin America, what is the tension between my indigenous side and my Spanish side, and you know, living that tension. And that also helps me effect a change. As Nicole was saying, now we are recognizing the value of uh, you know, different types of knowledge and their protocols. And also Lilia and myself, since the moment we met, we've had a brave ideological conversation. You know, when, when you, are, you work in a team, you need to have this conversation. Who are you? Uh, where are you going to? Ideologically and politically. And that's also important. And uh, it also shows, you know, when you do a truly TD work. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. Lily, please. Um, yeah, so one thing I'll say is that I do feel optimistic, I guess just to close this out in the last minute, is I feel optimistic that there's a change happening around um, the valorization or the valuing of local and indigenous knowledge. And I feel like that change has been um, very strong over the last decade, but especially in the last few years where I do think the scientific community is beginning to really um, shift in how these types of knowledges are valued and also in seeing these the integration of these types of knowledges as very important um, and even in some cases mandatory. So now I've actually begun to see, and maybe this is more in the, the context of North America and the United States and Canada, 
that projects that do not incorporate local or ancestral um, or indigenous values or ways of knowing um, are actually now often critiqued. Um, and so this, this shift, I think, is actually very positive um, in that more and more review committees, and I know there's a lot of places where this needs to change, but I've been seeing on grants that I sit on, grant committees, that either people from a local community or an indigenous group um, actually sit on these review committees and look for this type of knowledge or that it is a part of a rubric now. And so if it's missing, that actually now is a detriment. So I would just say that we are seeing a shift um, in this happening. And I, I see that as one positive kind of optimistic piece, so. That's amazing, Lily. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, to respect everyone, uh, everyone's time, I'd like to close this amazing session uh, without, uh, um, we have to have a really huge thank you to our presenters here and our transdisciplinary team that led us through these five incredible sessions. Um, and I'd like just to highlight to everyone, if you have any doubts about the evaluation criteria on the concept note, please approach your facilitators and also any other kinds of suggestions, evaluations about the process of the course. We are open to hear what you all thought about uh, our course. And see you all on our last session uh, next Thursday. Thank you so much, everyone.